trying to rip each other's head off. So the referee blows the whistle and then everybody stops, shakes hands and it's like, hey, let's go have a beer. Hello and welcome back to Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Ryan Wilson and Jamie Roberts. And this episode is brought to you in partnership with the famous Grace, the official whiskey of the British and Irish Lions. So later in the show, we'll be celebrating the spirit of rugby and we'll also be joined by a man who embodies the spirit better than most in ex-South African captain, John de Villiers, to discuss the Lions squad and much more. How are you guys? Very good. Thank you, Christina. The French have done it again. All French European final. Scares me. Scares me the trajectory French rugby's on. It's pretty yeah. exciting, isn't it? Yeah, they're it on the move, exciting. aren't they? They're they're on the they are move. on the move. They are on the move. The, it's, it's been, they've been a sleeping giant for a while at test level and club level, and it just seems like their stars are aligning somewhat. Um, I think over the last decade, we haven't really seen the French sides come to the fore, and I just, I just think over the foreseeable, they're just going to dominate Europe. COVID situation in France, um, obviously they've envisaged in two or three weeks' time that the situation is going to be better in Twickenham. I don't know if they're envisaging fans in Twickenham. I think they are at the minute, uh, maybe 10,000 or socially distanced for the final. But the way things are in France, um, the COVID situation there is not quite as good there as it is here and there would be no fans in Marseille. So, yeah, so that's answering the question, basically. That's what I was going to say. Do, are there, is there fans at Twickenham? If yeah. there's fans, then it makes sense. I think I'd rather play at Twickenham with fans, even if they're not your own fans, for a little bit of atmosphere. You know, people still get down to the stadium, have a good, good day out. I think I would prefer that, really. Yeah, I see. I thought I saw the restrictions in France now. It's like they, the the cafes and restaurants and bars and stuff, they're all open. They're opening back up again, but there is still a curfew. So when I heard that, I was kind of thinking, oh, well, could they potentially move it back then to France? But um, yeah. no, I think they're definitely behind on the fans side of things. So listen, if it's at Twickenham and they've got fans there, then go for it. Because uh, even if they're not your fans, like I said, I think a little bit of atmosphere goes a long way, eh? especially in a final like that. What about now the Toulouse game? Did you guys catch the the big talking point, um, which was when Toulouse captain Julian Marchand escaped that big red card over his headshot? I know Brian O'Jessica came out to say it was like the reddest of red cards. How did you guys see it? it well, it was it was a blatant red card, wasn't it? I don't know how it wasn't picked up. Mate, he hasn't even got the ball in his hands. And it's a high shot, firstly, and it's a shoulder to the face. So... With, with the laws they are at the moment, that's a red card. I don't know if you saw it, Jamie. I had to watch it back. I didn't actually watch that one, but... Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a supporting tackler. I think if, if the player that's been hit stays down, it's a red card. Uh, but the fact that he's kind How of played on... Is that, that we're saying I know. Though? Well, this is a thing. I mean, the TMO isn't point. going to be picking something like that up. Um, and it is a shoulder to the head, hasn't wrapped. Unfortunately, you know, Marchand has slid it up the uh, his you know teammate as well is kind of slidden up over his shoulder and it's shoulder straight to the underside of the underside of the chin is with force and it's reckless but how often do we see TMOs only going back to incidents when the player who's been injured stays down and then they go oh god he's hurt let's have a look at it oh okay we pick it up it's true though mate. Um, it is yeah. true. and I've seen it like over the last few weeks even playing that players are milking stuff like that on purpose now what a shame that we're starting to get that in the game. Yeah, well, no doubt. You know, you if you if you do get a high shot to the chin, you kind of feel something might be a bit of a card. You would stay down now. You'd stay down, wouldn't you? You know, if it means that a, a opposition player would get a yellow card, I'm not saying I'd do it. Ryan, I'd, I'm not saying you'd do it. But if you think about the context of the game and how the inf- influential the TMO is now, um, there's no doubt that players are being coached that if they sense any sort of foul play from opposition players, that they would stay down. I know. That's the worry, though, eh? The worry is that that's what we're, we're getting to. It's like when you watch football, I still don't understand. See, when they get fouled and then they grab hold of the ball as they fall on the floor, and then the ref yeah. has no option but to give the foul because they're like, you've just grabbed hold of it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see a ref just come out and sample like yellow card. Yeah, it annoys yeah. me. So, oh, God, it's scary, isn't it? But, um, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, they were lucky. They were lucky to escape the red, Christina. In partnership with the famous Grace, we're celebrating the spirit of rugby, especially the bond between players and fans across the four home nations and also those who the Lions play against. So we're delighted now to have on the show the legendary John de Villiers. Welcome to the show, John. Yeah, thank you very much. Awesome to be on the show. 
Thanks for, for coming on. Um, so I suppose, look, the squad has been named this week. Uh, the countdown is officially on for the tour in South Africa. So what's the, the latest with the COVID situation over there? To be honest, uh, the COVID situation in South Africa is actually very much under control at the moment. Um, so, so yes, yeah, still, you know, some, some cases um, all around. And um, I think the, I think we had like 20, I suppose 20 deaths, which is 20 too many. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in like the last week or something like that. Um, but it's, it's pretty much under control, to, to be honest. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about the third wave coming and, and being prepared for that. But um, as things stand, you know, touch wood, it, it's, it's looking pretty good. And, you know, that's, I suppose that's what we want. If you look from a cricket point of view and what's going on in the IPL at the moment and India and just the, the abs absolute um, devastation there at the moment, you know, so yeah. it's, we, we count ourselves lucky. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to turn my computer on and show you the beautiful sunshine and the mountains in the background. And it's, you know, good to be outdoors. So pretty cool in South Africa at the moment. So you, I suppose so at, the, at the moment, everyone is confident that the tour can definitely go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not in the, the inner circle in terms of the decision making, but, but still I am involved with, the, um, with some of the brands involved and, and they, they're feeling confident, you know. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether the decision has been made, um, whether there'll be people in the stands or not. Um, or, you know, at, at one stage it was, you know, pushing to try to get 50% capacity. Um, then there were talks of about 10,000 people per match. I don't know. But in terms of the, of the tour itself going ahead, I, I feel pretty confident that, that we'll be able to, to, to have the tour in South Africa. I don't know if it will be the experience that, Jamie, that we had back in 2009, but, um, but certainly uh, Alliance to him, I'm really confident that it will happen in South Africa this year. Exactly. Mate, does it worry you the box haven't played since the World Cup final? Or do you think it's potentially a weapon for them? Oh, it's difficult to see how it can be a weapon. Um, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's difficult when the last game you ever played together as a team was like, what, 18 months ago, World Cup final, the euphoria of that, a couple of players retiring. And so you lose some experience. And, and arguably two of the most influential players in that team, being Dwayne Vermeer and Andre Pollard, being injured for a lot of the time. Andre Pollard made his debut this weekend. Dwayne Vermeer is still not playing. Um, you know, so, so you can't change much. Uh, even from a player point of view, you can't really change the personnel and select other guys because there's been limited rugby. You haven't tested um, new players at international level, at test match level. So it's a big concern. Um, in saying that, I think Rossi Erasmus, the one, the one thing that he's done over the years is he is impeccable in terms of planning and he'll have some, some, something up his sleeve again. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, can they come together in a short space of time and, and, and perform three tests in a row. Well, I think for once, it's, it's maybe a similar situation to the Lions themselves. John, who are you going to be looking out for to be a standout player and make the difference for the box? I don't see, I don't see a lot of change in terms of the starting lineup that played in the, in the World Cup final, to be honest. Um, um, obviously, injuries, um, you know, um, taking that into account. But um, being a midfielder myself, I think Damien Delende, the way that he played last weekend, was it last weekend against Leinster? Um, and the performance that he put up, you know, kind of his experience now of playing against a lot of the guys that'll, that'll be in the, in the Lions squad. Um, you know, I think he's got, a, he's got a massive role to play. Andre Pollard probably will be playing next to him at, at 10. Um, but he'll need to take on a much more senior role. Um, so that'll be key uh, for us. And, and then Cheslin Colby, again, he's, he, he just seems to get better and better, and he really has the X factor, and, and hopefully he can, he can deliver in the test matches. So you always look at the backline players to have the impact in the game, right? Yeah. Do you think Andre Esterhuizen has a chance? I've been watching quite a lot of his rugby this year with Quinns, man. Impressive player. Do you think they could play Dialende and him together in the midfield? I, I don't see that happening. You don't uh, see it? 
I, I think, look, Jamie, I think we, we, you take the success of your, of yourself and, and buying a Driscoll in 09 and, you know, having, um, you know, having the, the bigger player that can get massive momentum like yourself and then, you know, a, a bit more, well, actually a lot more speed and, and flair in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the, in the third tier channel. Um, you know, that really works. So, and the combination of a, um, of a, uh, Damien De Linde and Lucanio Am, um, you know, has really worked for the box. So I can't, I can't see them playing the two together. It will be a like for like swap. If De Linde does not make it, then Este definitely comes in because he, he's been very impressive at, at Twins, I think. Do you reckon the Lions need to match that with a similar thing then in the centre? Because there's been a lot of chat around Manu Tuolangi and trying to get someone like him in there to match it up with someone, I don't know, one of the Irish centres or something. Do you reckon that's yeah. what the Lions need to do, Sean? Look, I think I think if if Manu's fit, you 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 pick him, um, yeah. you know. And if he, you know, obviously not a lot of rugby under his belt, but um, you know, he's a he's a player that can really change the game. He, he provides that kind of momentum, and he, you know, he keeps the defense busy. So, um, you know, who you combine him with, I don't know. I've, I've really struggled to 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 really nail which which players they'll they'll take even on tour in terms of the midfield and and which combination makes the most sense. Uh, you know, so yes, you select money, but then again, you need to be smart in terms of who you partner him with. Um, again, that's my view. Having played with and against money, it's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a great player and he, he can really, uh, it's not that easy defending against him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. John, I completely agree with you, man. I, I try and sit down and pick four midfielders and I really, I struggle uh, because there's probably seven or eight they're going to pick from. And as a focal point, only Robbie Henshaw, for me, is is definitely going at the minute. He's over the last season, he's been that go-to ball carry, smart defensively, and wings collisions. George North is a huge loss, I think, yeah. for, for the Lions, because he's that guy who can run into traffic and, and get you a few meters, he can get you momentum. Uh, that's why I reckon Ryan, your Scottish mate, Duan van der Merve, now George is injured, has got a better chance. They might have to try and get that momentum from from their wingers, uh, like Nadolo does at Leicester, um, etc. So, yeah, I mean the midfield's tough, man. I, I think it's as challenging a position as scrum half. We're all talking about scrum half in this country and who's going to go, but I think the the midfield is similarly really difficult to pick. Yeah. yeah, and and also then you look at the kind of the you know selections previously um, with Gatlin and, and obviously the the Welsh link, you know, having a bit of experience of the Lions tour in there as well. So so I suppose uh, uh, Jonathan Davies will will definitely be there and thereabouts. Um, you know, he can play at twelve and thirteen. Uh, but same question: where do you play him and who are you partner him with? You know, I'm a I'm a big believer of of partnerships in the midfield, you know, a combination and really understanding each other and, and no one kind of, you know, pops out. So, yes, sometimes you put two great players together and they just, you know, it works, but uh, it's it's risky as well. So um, Then you have to start looking more inside. So you got a 10. Who is the least, what's the 10 you least want to play against, spring box wise? Like, are you more worried about the attacking game of Finn Russell and what he can do in attack? Or are you more worried about someone that's going to kick the lever off the ball like a Johnny Sexton or something like that? Yeah, well, thank goodness I'm not playing. I don't have to make these decisions. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, but it's, yeah, you know, I, I always, like, if, if you go into a World Cup final um, tomorrow, you know, I always ask the question, you know, who would I want as my flop? Would it be Johnny Sexton or would it be Finn Russell? And I'd, I'd probably go Johnny Sexton. And yes, Finn, Finn Russell has got the ability to really break open a game and he's got that X factor and he can change things. Uh, um, but, you know, I don't know if I would want to go into a game starting with him, you know, as a, as a teammate, whether I'd have the, the confidence. Um, I might eat my words, you know, in, in two, three months time, but, you know, that, that's kind of my view. And I think, I think he can, he's the kind of player that can have fantastic impact off the bench. Um, you know, playing in the half felt as well um, at altitude, it, you know, the last 20 minutes becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, the last 20 min minutes becomes really important because, you know, sometimes you just can't keep up and, um, and you can kind of keep the wall there for, for 60, 65 minutes. And then it really breaks open, forwards get tired in the last um, the 20, 15 minutes. And, um, and where a guy like Finn Russell can, can totally break defences apart then. So, 
that that might be the you know where they use him. Um, is Farrell still in the, in the running? You know, is is bigger the one that they'll go for? It? Yeah, I th- I think Gatlin's biggest problem is that in some positions he just has so many options. There's no yeah. one guy that, that that's just so much better than the others. Um, so. Well, John, yeah. knowing um, knowing what you need to do to get the job done in South Africa, who would you pick for your starting lines 15 for the first test? I'd play the worst players ever because I want South Africa to work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so you're asking the, uh, the, the Lions team I would select? Yeah, I am. Guys, this is so difficult. I'm going to... I'm going to go... Well, give us your Lions back line. You, you don't care about forward, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> I do care. If, if the forwards don't perform, then we never get the ball, right, Jamie? Yeah, fair, yeah. Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just said it to make you happy, right? Um, but let, let's start with the back line. Um, I'm going to start with 10. <laughs> it's bloody hard, isn't it? Yeah. When yeah. people ask that yeah. question, you're like, yeah. where do you... Oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with ten. Um, I'm gonna go Sexton. Um, I'm actually gonna go, you know, if if fit, assuming that Manu is fit, I'll go I'll go Manu. Um, and Henshaw, I'll go the two of them. Um, wings. Um, uh, what the Reese Sermat? What, what, sorry, I got uh, Lewis Reese Sermat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The young rock star from Wales. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go with him. I'll go with him. Um, speed. Yeah, you got the speed. I mean, he's been fantastic. Um, you know, and I'll go. I'll I'll go. It's, it, it'll be a bold call, like a bold call. But I'll go Duan van der I think. You know what? What you want? What you? What you need to be able to, um, um, you know, the, the kind of pressure that will be put on you from a South African point of view, I, I think he'll be able to, to take that. I think he's got the, the physical edge. You know, he's, he's not just big. He can, you know, he's got the speed as well. Um, but he's also not bad in the air. So, um, again, there are, there's so many. I mean, Jacob Stockdale for me was like a shoe in maybe a couple of months ago. And, and, you know, suddenly he's, he's not even even in the mix anymore. And I suppose fullback uh, is the, the easiest of the lot. And we'll, we'll see a, a Scotsman starting there at 15. Um, so so St- Stuart Hoggett at 15. Um, Bloody hell, two Scots in there already. This yeah. is great sorry. for you, Ryan. What's going on, John? What's going so, on? Sorry, uh, I forgot that Duan van der Merwe is a Scotsman. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And, and purely, purely because of, again, combinations, um, you know, I'll, I'll then go Conor Murray at nine uh, with Johnny Sexton. Um, you know, they've played so much rugby together. Uh, they will provide a, a, a solid kicking game. And, you know, Conor has been, been on the tour before. He knows, you know, he, he knows what, it, what you need to be able to do, what, how you need to deliver. Um, so I'll go there. Um, forwards. Um, Back row, I'll go Falatau. I'll go um, uh, what, what's the what's the other Scot- Scotsman's name? Hamish, Hamish Watson. Hamish Watson. Hmm. Hamish Watson. I'm just testing you guys, okay? Um, I'm surprised you know the forwards' names, mate. Yeah, uh, I never knew my own forwards' name. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'll go Curry. Okay. It might it, it might limit you a little bit in terms of, of line outs, uh, but again, I think the game, the, the kind of player you need, I think they they might be they might terrorize the box, you know, at, at breakdown time as well. So um, that'll be good. Uh, Toje, Alwyn Jones in the in, uh, as the locks, um, and then the front row. I will go. Again, I was swaying towards a Makovin Apollo. He's totally gone off the boil. Um, I go take furlong at tight end. I will go. 
I will go Owens at two. Ken Owens at two. Who am I going at two set, guys? You're well, winning Jones and Lucy. You know what? You're doing so well. Fellow like, Welshman. The other boys had time to prepare, and I put you on the spot. So you're, and you're being honest will, as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go with Jones. Um, what's it, Xander Ferguson? The the the, the is he the loose head right for Scotland? Yeah. Um, but Win Jones, yes. Win Jones, you know, Kean Healy again, maybe, maybe not. Um, Win Jones probably the one to go with with Owens and Ty, um, and Furlong, yes. You know, they know going over there. This isn't just something that that happens in South Africa. I guess in New Zealand or Australia either. Players only have one shot in their career at playing against the Lions. You know, you've you've mentioned a few names who might make a second tour, but. For, for the majority of players in South Africa, it only comes around once in their career and they want to, they want to grasp that with both hands. They don't want to be remembered as a side who lose against the Lions. Um, so that pressure's on and that pressure, you know, often brings out the best in players. So, yeah, it's going to be an amazing series against the backdrop of a very different world, I guess. Yeah, Jamie, and uh, look, and I, I can only relate to to my experience um, in my career. And I look back at you know the the number of test matches that I played, and um, and 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 some of the jer- you know rugby jerseys that I that I still have, and some of those that I swapped. And I mean, your your jersey of of, of two thousand and nine, uh, you know, where we swapped is is one of my most cherished um, ones that I have. You know, and and in terms of the the memorabilia that I have of my career, you know, that is one that I, uh, you know, that I almost value the most, uh, you know, so uh, it's extremely special and you don't want to miss out. Uh, and when you do get selected, there, a lot of emotion goes with it and with a backdrop of what's happened in the last uh, 18 months, you know, back to 2019, there will be even more emotion from a South African point of view and it, it, it might be able you know, it might be a situation where they actually need to tone down a little bit. You know, otherwise the, the emotion can take over uh, as a negative. Sean, I just want to check. That is because it's a Lions journey, not because it's <laughs> yeah, James. Yeah, just to confirm that. Let me just confirm that, because I see his head getting bigger. <laughs> no. And that's a worry, because yeah. it won't get on the screen in a minute. Can I mention how much money he offered me to say that? But... Oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> Well done. Uh, but it's it's it, it's a bit of both, okay? It's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've got your jersey as well, Sean. Um, so yeah, it's so amazing. You, so you actually decided to keep it. Thank you very much. It's uh, yeah, yeah, okay, awfully, yeah, awfully yeah, kind. Yeah. Awfully kind. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. Well, to celebrate the, the famous Grouse's spirit of rugby, can you tell us the player who encapsulated the spirit of rugby the most throughout your career and why? Christina, that's an extremely difficult question. Um, There's been so many, and I, and I suppose, from my point of view, I have to go for a South African, um, you know, because you only you only get to you see so many players uh, that you play against, and and you experience what they are like as a as a rugby player, um, and and I've played against amazing players over the years, but it's not a, it doesn't have happen often that you get to experience the person behind. Um, you know, behind the rugby player. And, and luckily, you know, in, in Jamie's case, we've been able to, to socially uh, engage a little bit and get to know each other off the field, but it doesn't happen that much. And, and that's why I say, you know, I need to go from a South African point of view because you, you, need, you need to look at someone like that holistically. And, and someone that really, um, that really captured that for me was John Smith. And a World Cup winning captain, um, you know, a great player in his own right, but you know, having having been through his journey with him, um, or such a long period of his journey with him, the way that he dealt with with everything around it, all the extra stuff, the criticism, the sponsors, the everything that goes with being a Springbok and being a captain, you know, he's just a he's a phenomenal guy, and um, you know, really special individual, fantastic rugby player, and he was a great captain. Um, I will add one as well because you know the spirit of rugby is a it's beautiful you know I think that's why I love the game that's why uh, yeah you know it, it has taught me so much and given me so much uh, and when I played my hundred test match in in Wellington New Zealand um, I played against Maanoni and uh, just before half time um, he he tackled me and 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 he basically broke his arm 
And at half time, they obviously looked at it and, and um, <clears throat> uh, took him to the hospital. Um, so we finished the game. We actually lost the game 14-10 uh, in Wellington. But when I got back to the change room in my locker, my actually took time to take his jersey, you know, put it on my seat as a, as a sign of kind of respect for me playing my 100 test match. Um, and I think stuff like that tells you much more than the unbelievable rugby player that my nonu was. Uh, so as a very close second, I'll go for a my nonu. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a touch of class, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, and, and, and I, that's the bond that, that we as rugby players have. Um, you know, and I, and I always use the example, you, you try and rip each other's head off whilst playing for those 80 minutes and then literally, you know, the random oak that's the referee blows the whistle and then everybody stops, shakes hands and it's like, hey, let's go have a beer. You know, that's crazy, like, isn't it? When you, think, yeah. <laughs> when you think about it objectively, what a berserk <laughs> sport we play. <laughs> and, and so many that's... times you see, you see like a brawl at the end of the game and guys want to, you know, and then the, and the whistle, and they go, I can I know, I, everything forgotten. Uh, yeah. It's beautiful. You've played in some huge games over the years, but do any come close to the 2013 Tri-Nations decider against New Zealand? Because now Nigel Owens even said that it was the best atmosphere he's ever witnessed. So what are your recollections from that incredible encounter? Yeah, look, it's not often that you, that you have in your top three games or top five games that you ever played in, um, you know, include it, including a loss. But that 2013 is definitely one of them. I just think that the quality of the game, um, everything that was at stake for that game and, and just the, the performance of both sides. And, and yes, we lost it, but it was, it was immense. The atmosphere was great. You know, I can remember the lead up to the game and, you know, I was captain at that stage. The press conference on the Friday, the captain's press conference, you know, we had, we had teams from the UK flying in, uh, you know, to, to do the game uh, and, and um, um, you know, news, news teams from, from the UK. And, the, you know, the coverage was, was huge and the, the interest was huge, you know. And, and I think on the day we were able to deliver, both teams were able to deliver. So it was, it was crazy. It was an amazing game. Unfortunately, we lost it. You know, we, we had to score four tries against the All Blacks uh, and win the game. We got the four tries, but unfortunately they, they outscored us on the day. And there's, there was a big question around that game in relation to why you didn't react to New Zealand substituting on an unregistered player in Dan Coles. So why did you not react negatively to that move? Because if you chased that up, surely um, there was a chance you would have won the championship because the points would have been de deducted. Yeah, look, it's, it's again one of those things. Um, you know, it's, it, was a, it was an honest mistake. Um, by their manager, whom I've, I've got to know quite well over the years as well. And, um, you know, and he, he even came onto the field and said, look, I, I made an honest mistake, yeah? Um, and, uh, you know, can we just move on? And, and I said, look, I, I think I made a comment. Uh, I think I made a comment actually to Nigel there and said, no, let's just, let's just play on and give us some points on the log. Um, jokingly, not knowing that that might actually have been the case um, if we if we stop the game, but uh, again, it's the spirit of the game being able to, be, to come in and uh, assess what's going on and and decide what's best for for rugby, not necessarily just for us, but for the game of rugby. And um, and I thought it was the right decision then. So um, we all make mistakes, and I you know I'm I'm a little bit naive sometimes, but I would like to to think that <clears throat> excuse me, it was an honest mistake from their part and. And you could just go on and play the game. Fair play to you. Fair play to you. I know what it's like to make a mistake. I made a mistake last week on the show and the boys would not let me live it down. And it was a very small mistake. So um, it is tough having to admit that you're human every now and then. Yeah, it happens. It I happens. was bitter about it. Jeez. I'm not bitter about it at all. <laughs> let it go. Jeez. <laughs> um, John, you're possibly... Christina, Christina, would you like to talk about it? <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back later oh. and we'll have a chat through it because, uh, yeah, you might be able to give me some wise words about how to get through it. Um, yes. No, but look, you're possibly now the most unlucky player in World Cup history, having missed out on four campaigns due to injury. So I think that up to 2015, you'd been to two World Cups, but had only lasted two nights on the tour. Um, so of all the campaigns that you did miss, which one kind of goes down as the one that you're most regretful for missing? Yeah, look, um, uh, but 20, 
2007. Um, you know, again, so so got selected for 03, last warm-up game, got injured, didn't even make it onto the onto the plane. Um, 07 played the first game, five minutes into into the first game, um, I, I ruptured my bicep and and, and it was tour over. Um, uh, 2011, first game against Wales, actually tackling Jamie, popped two ribs, tackling him, because he's just such a beast of a player, right? Elbows uh, and knees, mate. Elbows <laughs> and knees. Um, <laughs> and luckily, I, <laughs> I, luckily, I stayed on uh, uh, on the tour and, and played in the quarterfinal, but but you know didn't didn't end that that well, obviously. And then um, broke my jaw in the second game in in 2015, and yeah, international career over. So a lot to reflect back on, but the fact that we won the World Cup in 07 and, and it was amazing being there for the for the final. Um, I celebrated as if I scored the, the winning try of, of the World Cup final. Um, but the, the fact that we won it and you know, I was such a, I suppose I was a big part of the lead up to to the World Cup and, and then missing out, you know, it, it just feel it, it, it's a it's a bittersweet, sweet one. Uh, Yes, if you get the medal, but I, I never felt as if I really, um, yeah, as if I really deserved it. And you did just mention there that you retired from Test Rugby in 2015, but then you went on to join Leicester for a season. So how did that move come about? Yeah, again, so, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a really bad knee injury uh, back in 2014, almost retired then and, and then made it back for the, for the World Cup in, in 2015. Uh, a couple of weeks before the World Cup broke my jaw, uh, lost to Japan in the first game and then broke my jaw the following week again and, and retired. Um, you know, and then I was contemplating whether, you know, whether I would just hang it up or, or maybe have another stint. Um, Aaron Major at the time involved at Leicester and, you know, they gave me a call um, uh, with Richard Cockrell and they said, well, you know, would I like to come over, add a bit of experience to the, uh, to the squad there as well. Um, and then you know, took that opportunity, having experienced the, the great time at Munster and, and you know, a different club, a different environment, and and I really enjoyed my time at, at Leicester as well. But unfortunately, my body was just, you know, it was uh, it wasn't ready for rugby anymore. Ended up just playing two games, hurt my knee again, and and, and that was it. So again, a great experience, meeting so many people, um, and players that I always played against. But uh, unfortunately, from a rugby point of view, it didn't it didn't pan out the way I wanted it to. Christina, how do you always manage to finish on such sour notes? I'm not finishing uh, yet. Like, I'm finished yet. We've gone like the highs and then you start bringing it down. Can we pick it up with something happy? Because you just talked about all of the World Cup stuff. Now we're going Leicester injuries. Well, would you like, what, what questions would you like to ask? <laughs> I'm, I'm, very, I'm very used to doing um, interviews about my rugby career and it's mostly being filled with my injuries. So, um, yeah, it's, it's nothing, nothing out of the, out of the uh, ordinary. Well, I mean, it's an amazing career to celebrate. Like you've what you've you've been on the Lions tour, or you've you played against the Lions. Geez, you've captained the box. Like you know, you've got you, you played against Jamie several times. You have a jersey of Jamie. Jeez. I mean, it's an unbelievable career, Christine. I'll I'll tell you what. Like I, when I was a kid, um, like I obviously growing up in the home nations, you, you see South Africa, New Zealand, Australia as the teams. You know, the old tri nations. Used to watch him as a kid quite a bit, and then he, you know, I was lucky to to play for Wales. And in my third cap, um, we actually taught South Africa. My second cap, I actually played fullback. And then my third cap, um, I'm saying Sean Edwards came up to me in the week, he's like, right, do you want to play in the midfield uh, on the weekend? And, and we were playing the box at Loftus Versfeld, right? And you know, I was I was a bit of a midfielder when I was a kid, so I was looked up to, you know, Nonu, Mortlock, De Villiers were, were the were those that wore 12, you know, they, they were the kind of standard bearers across the Tri-Nations. And here I was as a young kid, I had to face Jean de Villiers at Loftus Villiers, well, World Cup champions, bear in mind, in 08, when we toured there with Wales. Um, and, you know, for me, that was, I'd made it. This is the ultimate. Like, I got to play against someone who I'd grown up admiring in the 12 jersey, Jean, um, and, you know, got to play opposite him. Uh, I'm not sure if we swapped jerseys that game, Jean. We might, we might have actually. Um, but then obviously got to play against you in the 09 Lions as well. But I think from from my point of view, what I'm trying to say is you were the kind of archetypal midfielder. 
um, for the box and someone who I definitely kind of model my game on, you know, as a ball carrying midfielder yeah. and it was obviously a huge strength of yours. So yeah, as Christina, as much as we're talking about the injuries, sack that all off. Let's, no, let's give this guy the credit he deserves at number 12. Thanks Jamie. It's, it's, it's very kind of you. Uh, I think we might've swapped jerseys there, but I, I gave that one away. Oh, you give that one at auction that <laughs> <laughs> want to get a thousand rand. No, I could I could remember we, we actually flew mm-hmm. together from Bloemfontein the, the first test uh, together, the well the Welsh and the South African team. Yeah, we did, to, yeah. To Pretoria, yeah. I remember it well back in oh eight, yeah. You played at Loftus and uh, yeah, yeah, you battered us, but shit, that was the year Shane Williams was on fire and scored that outrageous try. Yeah. Um but I also yeah. scored I also scored two that game, but it's irrelevant. Is what it is. John, how many how many times have you scored over your career? Uh, for South Africa, yeah, uh, twenty seven, I think. I might be wrong. And what was your favourite one? My favourite one was probably. Um, I think my best one was against England in two thousand and seven, prior to the World Cup. We played in Bloemfontein as well, and I, I scored a pretty pretty cool individual try then. But the one that that had the and you always base these on on the the meaning of the team and the, and the result at the end um, was the one that I scored in two thousand and nine against New Zealand in Hamilton um, to to win the the, the Tri Nations that year um, so in, intercept try uh, got a, a sweet loved an pass. intercept De Villiers loved an intercept yeah. didn't they so got a got a nice pass from from the great Dan Carter and able to score. Under the sticks, and we and we won the game. So that was that was pretty cool. That's class. Now I was kind of buttering you up, you up there because I do have one kind of tough question to ask you, but then I will finish on a nice question if that's okay. That's fine. I'm ready for anything. All right. Um, I have to ask you about your experience of working under Peter de Villiers. Now I know Tende Matawera has criticised his reign as head coach of the box, saying that his methods and training regimes didn't work, and that he actually made the squad. T- terrified to speak to the media because he'd drop you if you were negative so is that a fair reflection oh no i don't you know i I certainly didn't didn't experience that um and again you know you your your experiences differ you know i think you know turned out you know he only started with his career then and obviously built an amazing career after that but um you know i think peter de villiers for me was um you know, he was he was the right guy at the time. We had an extremely um, experienced squad back then, and and he wasn't the most um, technically the the best coach out there. But I think the way that he that he treated us, the the way that he that he was able to to give a lot of the decision making to the players as well, I, I think we had the the team that could deal with that back then. So, um, you know, I, I never played under a perfect coach and, and, and certainly Peter de Villiers wasn't a perfect coach either. But I think at the time and, um, and what, he, what he managed to, to provide us, um, you know, I think was good. And his, his record speaks for itself in, in 2009, being able to beat the Lions, being able to win the Tri-Nations, um, you know, beating the All Blacks three games in a row that year. Um, uh, you know, that, that's amazing. So... Again, you take the good with the bad, with with all people, with all coaches, with all players, and you know my experiences of Peter de Villiers was, um, you know, was pretty good. Um, he coached me <clears throat> at age group level as well, so he's almost the guy that gave me my first chance as a you know at age group level to play for the South African under nineteen team. So there's a bit of history there as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, so so my opinion would be a little bit different. Okay, yeah, because I know, um, didn't Tende also say that it was the players who actually took the training and made the decisions which resulted in such a successful period? So was that true? Like, how much responsibility did you guys have? Like, were you essentially coaching the team or? I, I won't go that far. I, I think the, the, the senior group certainly had a, had a big influence and, and impact on the team. Um, you know, and but it was a oh, there goes the dog. Um, but it was a com- uh, it was a combination of you know of all of that the the coaching team plus the head coach plus the players. Uh, you know, and and you know never only have one person running running a team environment. So um, it certainly wasn't the players taking taking the you know every training session, but there was there was a lot of input from the players. I would agree with that. 
just to finish off then, who's the greatest player that you've ever played against and with? Yeah, I think I think taking into account what I what I said previously about uh, about my um, you know, I've I've played I've played against so many unbelievable centers over the years, and you know, at at one stage it would be that guy would be the best in in that position. You know, I, I think back Mortlock, Umaga, uh, Yannick Josian, O'Driscoll, uh, Danny Roberts. Uh, yeah, you know, there's so so many, but I think from my point of view, because we've played against each other super rugby so many times, against each other test matches so many times, uh, you know, he was an awesome player, playing more than 100 test matches for for uh, the All Blacks. So he would be he would be the best, um, and best I played with again, you know, so many. You, you have a Brian Abana and a Skulk Berg who both won. Um, World Players of the Year in in 04 and 07 respectively. Farida Pri, I think, was was probably the best nine ever to play for South Africa. And amazing rugby brain. Victor Matfield changed the way that lineups ran. Um, you know, so a combination of all of those. But I, I suppose with taking all of that into into account, the best one I've played with, um, I'm going to have to go with with one of those two guys. That won the world rugby player. No, I'm not. I'm gonna go for Rita Priya. Outrageous player. Unbelievable player. Just I, you know, that guy. I I remember um, the Lions test in Loftus, the second test, and it's the first time I've ever seen it done. I think you guys had a kind of left hand side scrum. And he, he kind of eight nine, and you're thinking, right, they're just gonna play a play here. And he cross kicks the ball over to the winger. Yeah. And at ping point, I think Peterson catches the ball and you know you guys make about 30 meters. And I'm watching it just going, what on earth is that? Like I've never, yeah. never seen a scrum off be able to do something like yeah. that. Proper no, was, unbelievable player. And also, you know, he the, the way that he understands the game and you know speaks about the game, it, it's it, it's phenomenal. So he he had the ability to make the right decision more times than not. Uh, and when you touch the ball as many times, you know, as a as a nine does. You know, it, it totally changes the game when he makes the right decision more times than not. Being able to hit the right guys, you know, when he's got runners. Being able to know when to run, when to kick, when to pass. So, great player, phenomenal player, and very, very fortunate to call him a friend as well. Awesome. Well, look, on that note, we will let you go, John. So thank you so much for coming on today. And a huge thanks to the famous Grace, the official whiskey of the British and Irish Lions, for their support of this episode. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you very much, and hopefully you don't include the bloopers. Ah, oh, I love the bloopers. They're my favourite part. <laughs> Guys, don't forget to join us for Rugby Pass's live show on YouTube and Facebook from midday on Thursday with Big Jim Hamilton, Andrew Good, Tom Shanklin, and Stephen Ferris as they give their live reaction to the Lions squad announcement. Uh, that is it from us. Thanks to Jean de Villiers, Ryan Wilson, and Jamie Roberts, and thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys. Farewell. Goodbye. Uh -oh. God bless.